Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. Oh, that's what I like. It is a good morning. It's especially good this morning because we're celebrating one book. And this is the fifth anniversary for one book. So let's give one book a hand. Five years. How about that? Perhaps I could uh, take a brief second and ask one book committee members to stand up. Let's recognize them. They did a lot of work putting this all together for us. Thank you. So it's the culmination of this great adventure that we've been on this semester, reading in the heart of the sea. And um, a lot of people have been involved in that great adventure. We have 26 faculty members in eight different discipline areas, and about 620 students have been involved in this adventure. And so it's really very exciting to see such a great semester coming to a close. Today we have a very special Sounds event, cool. Songs and Stories of the Sea. As you know, it's a wonderful event, but it's also co-sponsored by the Multicultural Committee, and we're thankful for their support in that regard. And after today's event, we're going to welcome you to come out to the brick area, just outside the auditorium, for some coffee and some conversation with our artists today. So without further ado, let me tell you a little bit about our artists. Kim and Reggie Harris are bringing to us a long tradition of folk music and gospel music with a background in classical rock, jazz, and pop music. Pretty exciting, something for everyone. They're coming to us as socially conscious musicians, and so they're going to help us to be able to think about the history of these songs as well as how they reflect the issues of social justice. I want you to also know that Kim and Reggie Harris are not just performing artists, that uh, they're well respected in scholastic circles. It's where they've been able to present many programs to educational institutions like us here at BCC. They also have a number of CDs, which I understand they will have available for sale today. So please look forward to them, uh, to those CDs, or if you're not able to stay afterwards, look them up on the internet. Um, and also, I want to let you know a little bit about some other special things about our artists, Kim and Reggie. I'll let you know that uh, Kim is now Dr. Harris. She received her PhD last year. We're very excited about that. All of us are very uh, excited about education. And Reggie Harris has a new mentor as well, where he is working with a group called Living Legacy Pilgrimage. Um, where they're moving uh, together in eight-day intensive bus tours that reflect the 1963 Freedom Riders and the Civil Rights Historic Sites. Isn't that exciting? So we are in for a heck of a treat. And uh, right now, without further ado, let's welcome Kim and Reggie Harris. But we fought him alongside and the last we thrust in 
Yeah. 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 But I love singing. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking. And uh, how many of you sang this morning in the shower? <laughs> how many of you have sung at least once in your life? How many of you came to raise your hands? <laughs> well, we are glad to be here, singing songs and telling stories of the sea. And we got to read the book, too. We're really happy about that. So thank you for the invitation. And in the song that I started off with, The Coast of Peru, now normally, you know, you have to tell an audience about all the little words in there, but you know, if we say a few things like, well, it's worth 500 pounds, and you know, it was trying out, you already know what all that means, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and because basically, that tells the story of many of the whaling voyages. It is one of the traditional songs, but that's only part of what we are here to do with and for you today. The other part that we're here to do, well, to get ready for that, please turn to the person next to you and say, I can't wait to hear you sing. I can't wait to hear you sing. Mm -hmm. I, I heard some people only sound semi-sincere when they said that. Mm -hmm. I'm on my way to freedom land. Now this, this is a song that, uh, well, it comes from African-American tradition of singing spirituals and singing in the call and response song form which is one that the people brought with them from their African homelands. So all you have to do is repeat after what I say, which means you get involved. Don't stop me now. If you don't go, 
that's right. That's only part of it. <laughs> Here's the other part. When you put together the style and the form of a song we just did, call and response from African and African American traditions, with the style and the form of that first song, the coast of Peru, that sea shanty song that comes more from the English and Irish and New England traditions. When you put those two things together, what you wind up with are some of the songs of the sea that reflect the African American sailors' traditions and experience. Now, we're really excited as we've been following along with what, you, with what you've been doing all semester. The fact that you had the author of the book, and then you had Jeff Bolster come and talk about black sailors. And I mean, it's, it's been a great program. And you can find all of that reflected in these songs that people were singing. Now, what's been very interesting, and I've been doing some research down at Mystic Seaport, is that there are some songs that were used as sea shanties. And sea shanties, basically, they are work songs. Work songs for people that are doing a rhythmic kind of work. You know, now we haven't heard a work song yet on sitting at your computer type of stuff. Out. You know, we have we have really haven't heard music. Yes. <laughs> so I think it's it might be up to us to write. Mm. Now, I think it's going to be up to him to write. Mm-hmm. But, but a work song. <laughs> oh, then think about something you're working at your computer writing work song. Yeah, come on with that, please. <laughs> but the, uh, the kinds of work songs that people were using on these whaling ships, they had to raise, as you well know, very big, heavy sails. There was lots of work to do that needed a very specific type of rhythm. So they talked about the things that were going on in their lives, like having to try to get around Cape Horn in the ice and the snow and the wind and the rain and everything else that was going on in the ship. And they put that information into this work song that they used. Gave them a chance to talk about the things they liked about being on the whaling ship and the things that they didn't like so much. But what we found in doing the research is that when you look in the first collection of Negro spirituals, 1867, the first large collection called Slave Songs of the United States, you can find songs with some of the same words that were being used on the ship. Except on that song, a song called Round the Corner Sound. In the Slave Songs book, it's called Round the Corn Sound. And they use it for a different kind of work, not sailing work, but husking the corn. But honestly, on a uh, sailing ship, when they said round the corner Sally, and sometimes they even said round the corner Sally, that meant going around Cape Horn. So you can see the way these song traditions really mesh with each other. So we're going to give you a little bit of round the corner Sally. Now, when you hear this, though, realize that we're singing it at a tempo that is much faster than you would use on a ship, or else we'd be singing up in here for the next, ooh, I don't know, three or four hours, and then, mm -hmm, that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> How, give us a little bit of a rhythm, please. Well, around the corner we must go. Oh, the sound. 
So the fabric of that, and it was very interesting to read uh, very early on in the book that they talked about the forecasting, and they talked about the fact that that was when that particular ship, and I'm sure on most ships, was very much a set date place. Uh, it's mentioned that Nickerson, the young boy who was on the journey, is very happy to not have landed himself in the forecasting. So we know that the tensions between the whites and the blacks on the ship are very clearly pronounced. And uh, and yet, it's mentioned, of course, that the, so much of the cultural life of the ship, in terms of singing, and, and in, uh, I remember them talking about uh, the sailors, that, the forecast being the only place where the officers were not going to come. And so that being a place where you couldn't really go there. And you sort of like air down a little bit, which is certainly the same kind of fabric that has been part of the American experience of slavery and and uh, of, of how American culture formed. The spirituals, of course, were coming out of, uh, of that experience of longing for freedom. I'm sure that in the way that we know that those black sailors on that ship were also getting lesser nourishment you know, from their rations. Um, it's mentioned that the Nantucket captains actually were kind of slave drivers. And that blacks on the ship were there in a very subservient role. And you remember them mentioning that they were treasured for their obedience, which I can't imagine somebody who was working on a slave ship being obedient just because they wanted to. You understand the dynamics of your place in that society and what you need to do to get whatever you could. Now, the other interesting piece about it is while you have this idea of you know, treasured for your obedience in this whaling ship, you also have the whaling ships and the maritime industry in general as a place of greater, well, what we say, greater protection, greater autonomy. greater autonomy, and a greater place to be able to find a little bit of freedom. And that's part of why they were uh, black sailors, uh, so many of them, because they could find a job. But if you had the skill, well, you know, they needed people that had those skills. And because the jobs on the ship are so delineated and such skilled positions, even while you would try to have somebody obedient or try to keep them down because of their race, you still knew they needed to do their job. And so you give them respect, do their job. So it's a really strange kind of world that's created uh, on these whaling ships and in the maritime industry in general. Uh, there's one of the Halyard songs, another one for raising the Halyard, 
that really ties into this book, Heart of the Sea. It talks about Alabama John Cherokee. Now, they're still doing research about where this song comes from. So the idea is that um, Alabama John Cherokee, he was a slave who escaped. He was uh, then recaptured and put in working on a whaling ship. But he kept trying to escape from the ship. That's kind of the story that this song is going to tell. But then they get him back. He's working on the ship. But then just like the black sailors on the Essex, he's given less food. And he's given such poor rations of food that he winds up dying and his ghost comes back to haunt them all. like 
Alabama John Cherokee escaped from slavery and would find themselves working on sailing ships. Now, one of the things that Jeff Bolster talks about this in his book, Black Jacks, if you know, and if you already know the story of how Frederick Douglass found a way, Frederick Douglass was a caulker. Okay, so he was working on the docks of Baltimore, a very skilled caulker. And as a matter of fact, he lived in what we would call these days his own apartment. You know? So he was a person that was enslaved. He lived on his own. And what he had to do was that he had to pay his master a certain amount of week. So every week he had to pay his master six dollars. Now, if, if Frederick Douglass made nine dollars, he got to keep three. If he made, you know, five dollars, he had to pay an extra, you know. But what Douglas was able to do was to borrow the Seamus Protection Certificate from another black sailor and to use that to make his own escape. And why did that work? Because it wasn't unusual to see a black sailor. So we have a song that reflects the experience of many people that escaped. There were secret code words that you can hear in these spirituals, and sometimes I think they also made it into the sea shanties. Words like heaven, now heaven, meant a place where you could go to be free. And sometimes that's how they used it in the spirituals. Sometimes it would be in a real specific place, like it might be Massachusetts, after Massachusetts got freedom. It might be Pennsylvania, New York, Canada. It could also mean freedom that you might find, your relative freedom, working on the way on the ship. But even if you're far away from slavery, the person that you love is not there. And so heaven is not as good as it could be. Heaven is less than a beggar. Shall I bring a lantern? Know the North Star. 
Well, one time, uh, one of the scenes in a book that particularly intrigued us was when the sailors were singing and praying as they were in those whale boats fighting for their lives, just trying to stay alive. And we wondered what song might they have been singing. And let's see if I can remember that. They said in particular that the black sailors were known for being uh, extremely spiritual. And so there were times when white and black sailors would gather together, especially when they were facing a storm and when they knew that their lives were going to be ending soon, that they would get together and uh, the black sailor would lead them in prayer. Now, you know his name is escaping me right now, so I don't know that all Probably all of them, all of them. And so, uh, you know, and we wondered what he would sing. So we did some research and we found uh, even earlier than that 1867 book of spirituals that African Americans had been singing, there was a book that came out early in the, uh, in the 18 teens from the African American, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Richard Allen put together a book of songs that were sung in his church. These words are words of Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts, who was very known, very known for writing the text of hymns. And there were some ways that white folks sang the Isaac Watts hymns, and there were some ways that black folks sang the Isaac Watts hymns. So we imagine that that black sailor leading them in prayer as they were dying, essentially, would probably use the way that he sang these in church. And you'll notice in his words that he talk about the scorching sand and leaving a stream of this thing. Mm -hmm.
right, so we're going to leave you with a song you can help us sing, and then we'll look forward to uh, meeting you out there for the, the coffee and the donuts, and yes, we will have uh, our CDs with us. Uh, we'll leave you with a Walk Away Halyard song. Roll the old chariot along. So instead of pulling this way, when they're raising the sail, they would actually all grab onto the halyard, the line, and just walk like this way to the door, okay? And uh, this song is definitely you know, related to Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, but it says, roll the old chariot along. Thanks again for the invitation and the opportunity to read an incredible book. And I started reading more books. Yeah, and you see you got a pile of books here. We, we, the way that works. That's the way that works. So. <laughs> yeah, y'all know all about that. So we'll look forward to seeing you out there and uh, we'll leave you with this. And then we'll rodeo, chariot along, we'll rodeo, chariot along, we'll rodeo, chariot along, and we'll all fall in behind. And then we'll rodeo, chariot along, we'll rodeo, chariot along. A bit of windy wouldn't do us any harm. A little bit of windy wouldn't do us any harm. And we'll all fall in behind. And then we'll roll it all. Chariot along, we'll roll it all. Chariot along, we'll roll it all. Chariot along, and we'll all fall in behind. And then we'll roll it all. Chariot along, we'll roll it all. Chariot along, we'll roll it all. Chariot along, and we'll all fall in behind. But now, hey, little bit of work it wouldn't do us any harm. A little bit of work it wouldn't